And welcome to our Classical Crossover Magazine interview with Luperci de Souza. Welcome, so good to meet you. Thank you so much, Natasha. Nice to see you too. Hope you're well. And fingers crossed, theaters will be reopening soon. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, what have you been doing? Have you been having any downtime or you've been learning new roles while you're in lockdown? Or well, I I was on a ship. I was doing a ship contract in the end of February, beginning of March, and I went to Brazil in the beginning of March, and then I came here to England, and then the lockdown started here. So right now, like, I'm just in the house. We are still, we are still under lockdown, but it's kind of been very productive, like learning a lot of new songs, and especially if, I think especially for us, like freelancers and, you know, especially singers at the moment that we don't have a job. It's so important that we keep up with the work and we try, we work on our show reel, on our CV. We do things that we can do right now. But yeah, being pretty busy in, in kind of in a self, selfish way, but I guess it's good. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So let's kind of go back for the people who might not be familiar with you. Um, you started singing in Brazil in a boys choir is that right yes i was at the age of six or seven years old and i started in a boys choir and i had my i had like my whole musical education i'd say for almost 10 years i was in that choir and i think you know i, I really loved singing and being in the choir and one thing led to the next i went into my bachelor's in music in brazil then I moved to Argentina to sing, I moved to Uruguay, and then I received a scholarship to do my master's in opera in Scotland. And that's when I really like, let's say I got to really know the classical world and the classical crossover world that really got to be present in it and fascinated me and never left. <laughs> But the, the original choir you were in, it was quite a famous choir, right? You did some amazing things, like you sang for Pope John Paul II, was that right? Yes, absolutely. It, it is the oldest boys choir in Brazil. It is very well renowned and we did have a very tough musical education. I'm very grateful for it. And we did sing for John Paul II, we sang for the Queen and for a few presidents here and there. But it was amazing. It was really an amazing experience to be in that choir. And then when you went to Scotland, um, what was that like? Did you kind of go, you ready, you knew you were a tenor, you kind of had your fuck figured out, or was it like you went there and you kind of learned more about where you wanted to end up? Well, it was a bit of a journey because I was in Uruguay at the time and I wasn't, let's say like, consolidated in the role of a classical tenor but I, I knew I was a tenor and I was having a, a career already I was singing in a choir and a professional choir doing gigs as a tenor singing operatic things but I didn't know for sure I was a tenor but once I received the scholarship I got a call from the conservatoire in Scotland and they said you have the scholarship you know will pay for the fees and everything and I was over the moon and the thing that there was only one little catch that I had to pass in an English test and at that okay. time I didn't speak English at all and I had like six months to learn English and learn how to pass oh, in the wow. test and <laughs> thankfully I did. Wow yeah that's a big ask to do. Um, so yeah what was it like there? Did they have operas in the conservatory that they put on or so what were Absolutely. some of your first roles? Like, um, I w I'm so grateful to the Conservatoire because they, they just have been elected, I think, last year. The top, they are in the top five conservatoires, music conservatoires in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's been just growing, growing, growing. I, in the time I was there, I had, was a two-year master program. And we had, every year, we had three main operas, main productions with orchestras, scenery, costumes, everything super professional. And my first role there was in a Baroque opera called uh, The Return of Ulysses in 
in the homeland, Il Ritorno di Ulisse in Patria, and I did Ulysses' son. The, the role is called Telemaco. That was my first role, and my first big role there, my major role, I guess, in the Conservatoire, was playing Tito in La Clementa di Tito by Mozart. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic opera, very challenging indeed for, for the tenor, and I think that was one of the biggest accomplishments I, I had in there. But also I did many other operas, just like doing gigs as well, you know, because it's such a wonderful city, like the conservatory is in Glasgow, and Glasgow is growing so much culturally that there's so much going on, and you get asked to do concerts and gigs, and it was amazing. And in fact, it was funny because once I saw the poster for the Classical Crossover magazine, I was looking at the poster and seeing who it was there. And Lucy, Lucy Kay, she's a friend of mine. She studied with me in Scotland. Yes, yes. <laughs> we, I was doing the Masters in Opera, and she was, I think she was in the, in the undergrad program at the time. I think she's a few years younger than I am. And I, I briefly met her in Glasgow, and we spoke a few times, and I've, I've seen her perform, and she's done amazing so far. Like she. She got to, to the finals in Britain Got Talent, and, but it is a fantastic city. The Conservatoire it has an incredible atmosphere and you really get involved in all the music scene and they do prepare you for... I think that's the hardest thing for us musicians is like, to be in a Conservatoire is fantastic, it's amazing, but that fear of leaving the Conservatoire and having to worry about, you know, mm. am I will I be able to work as a musician, as a singer, and, and have a life, or will I have to do another work, another job? So the Conservatoire really prepared us mentally as well to, to deal with that, because sometimes, and it's not demurring at all, it's, there's nothing wrong with doing some, another job, and it sometimes is actually better to just take your mind away from the worries in the musical world, especially right now, like people like me as a freelancer, I have no idea, although I have, I, I've been offered another contract to my company, I have no idea when that will be or when things will resume to, to normal, if things will do. And it's a very, like, it's a very obscure time for, for freelancers. So yeah. I was glad to be there and I was glad for all the education that they've given me. So they really prepared you as far as like auditions and getting jobs and reaching out to companies and that sort of stuff also? Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. We had like, we had audition classes that we had to perform for all the teachers and that was like a weekly, in a weekly basis. So you really had to like audition. It's such an important process, but it's also so nerve wracking because it, you, you have to become accustomed to it and you have, it has to be just like, okay, it's just one more thing. It's just a few people watching me and I'm going to go and sing. But it's never just that. So they, they they did the best they could, but an audition is always an audition. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you still get nervous. Absolutely. So um, I mainly discovered you through when you were in the group uh, Classic. Um, so one of the big mm -hmm. things that came out through that was your love for Mario Lanza and sort of the older pretty much like the precursor to classical crossover music, all that wonderful. So tell us how you were kind of exposed mm -hmm. first to classical crossover and that lovely tradition of all that older, like Be My Love and all those beautiful songs. Oh, absolutely. I think, I think the first introduction I had to classical crossover music, or let's say what created classical crossover music was Marilanza indeed, like I, I've heard a record of Lanza years and years and years ago. And it just fascinated me, like his voice and the way he acted it out. And, and he was, at the time, he was so famous. He was like a Hollywood star, what, what Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise would be nowadays. Yeah. He was immensely famous. And it was for, him, for, for his voice, like the tone and the, the warmth and the sweetness he had in his voice was incredible. And that, and just that, spoke to me in some kind of way and since then i think after him also like bocelli like nowadays bocelli is a, is a massive influence in, in the singing that i do as well and also pavarotti pavarotti although he wasn't really a classical crossover singer he 
I think he was one of the first ones who helped bringing classical music into to the masses, into to a wider public, let's say. You know, he was the one that brought his friends together and did concerts for thousands and thousands of people. And people, a lot of people know opera and know classical music because of him and because of people like him and Bocelli or Andrea Rieu, that it's so important like to, because many people say like, oh, I don't like opera, I don't like classical music, but they never had the opportunity to really listen to it. You know, they say because it's, it's normal to say it because if you don't know something, you, you are afraid of it. But I think it's super important, you know, I think every kid in school should have access to classical music because it makes such a difference in one's education. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, classical crossover, I know there's sometimes a lot of debate when it's not really said it's a separate thing because it can, the, the boundaries of it can go quite large. It can sound quite different from opera. Uh, um, <laughs> but I think one of the great things is it does bring people like, you know, I started listening to Charlotte Church and then you start listening mm -hmm. to like Joan Sutherland and, you know, it's it helps to bring absolutely. that in an accessible way, which is great. Um, do you sing differently absolutely. when you're doing crossover? Uh, I think I think you kind of have to like I was since my my music education my singing education was very operatic from the beginning and since I got into classical crossover not that I don't think there is really a boundary and I think you have to sing with your voice but you do have to change a few things here and there especially if you come from opera like I think the main thing is the vibrato and that you have to tame it down a little bit because I think you have to look, the thing that I'm working on right now that it's helping me a lot is listening to a lot of musical theater and a lot of like, not classical musical theater, but more pop musical theater and people like Ramin Karimlo who did the Phantom of the Opera and people like him that can really go in between classical and pop so smoothly. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges of classical crossover because you see people like Josh Groban, he doesn't have an operatic voice at all, mm -hmm. but he sounds classical in some songs and yet he sounds very pop in other songs. I think that's the main trick to try to be a bit popier if you come from from classical and try to be a bit more classical if you come from pop, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think also um, in some ways, like we think of the trained voice, like it's it's anomaly, but it used to be that all the great singers, you know, Frank Sinatra got some training in this, you know, that's what it used to be, is you'd come from that background of a really proper trained. Absolutely, absolutely. Frank Sinatra had massive training in, in classical singing in opera, and yet he was probably the most famous pop artist of all time. Obviously, you do a lot of opera, um, but you said like cruise ships. What are some of the other crossover venues that you have? So I, the first time I did cruise ships, I, I never had gone that far into the pop. And it was a challenge. Uh, I have to say it was a challenge, but it was an amazing challenge because in the company that I work, we usually have two in the same group. We have two opera singers, two musical theater singers and two pop singers. And to be able to share their experience, because we all sing together at the same time and we do backing vocals and then we do leads and we keep exchanging. And it's really interesting to see how other people with other techniques that are very different from yours approach a certain phrase or a certain note. 
and that was amazing but I went very far in the pop like I like last year or two months ago I was still the shows we had an opera show like a full-on operatic show we had a queen like Freddie Mercury show which was incredible I love queen and it's so hard because Freddie Mercury had that kind of operatic approach mm. um, it's really hard to sing only only Freddie Mercury could sing like that <laughs> Um, we did pop, like full-on pop disco music. We did some some British music, like Beatles and Elton John, and we like the the spectrum got really wide. And, <laughs> and a cruise ship, you have to be versatile. But it it's amazing. I've learned so much in cruise ships. And I think for the audience too, being able to see all of that in one show must be awesome because, mm. like you're saying, they might say, "Oh, I, you know, I don't really like opera." And then they're like, oh, well, but I, but I quite like the sound of that, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You do, the company I work for, we have a very, like, let's say, like, selective audience. They are, they are elderly people, mostly elderly people, very small ship, and so they know, they know very well about opera and about classical crossover. They are really into that kind of music and Broadway, musical theater. So when you do something like that, they really like, they really embrace you and they, they want to know everything about your life. And it's amazing. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been doing that for the past four years and I've, I've seen the world and I had so much pleasure singing. So what is kind of your uh, routine of keeping your voice in shape? Do you still take voice lessons? Um... Well, I I haven't taken voice lessons in a while now, mostly because of lockdown. Yeah. But that was one of my main goals once I left the cruise ship. I I said I'm going to have singing lessons with a musical theater tenor, ideally. And unfortunately, because of lockdown, I still didn't manage to have. But I really want to to go a little further into the musical theater. I've had some musical theater experience before but I really want to get more of that, let's say, popier approach in the tenor voice. But I try to, to do some vocalises and warm-ups a few times a week. I try, I think it's super important for, for singers to not just work out the voice as well, but just try to keep in shape because the voice is just the muscle. So if you work out your whole body automatically, the voice is going to be working as well. You know, the blood's going to be flowing through the voice. And so I try to do that at least five times in a week and trying to learn new songs. And I, I think it's just important to keep the voice flowing in these times where we are a bit uncertain of what's going to happen. And trying to like, I've been, I have to say like, I have used this time very, I, I've been, I'm very happy of how I've been using this time because I, I have one more video that, I'm doing with a Brazilian friend of mine. We are doing a, an Argentinian tango and we're putting together. So in the next, hopefully in the next few days or next week, we'll have it on my Instagram and Facebook, but learning new songs and trying to do videos here and there. Always good. What are some of the other new songs that you're working on? So I'm working on on this tango, this Argentinian tango, and I'm also, I want to record, I've been rehearsing for a while now. I love Lloyd Webber, and I'm diving into musical theater, and I love Phantom. I've auditioned for Phantom before. I got the part, but that's another story. But I, I, I'm singing, I'm rehearsing now, the solo from, his, from the sequel of the Phantom of the Opera, it's called Love Never Dies, the sequel and the, the tenor song is called Till I Hear You Sing and it's mm -hmm. such a beautiful song so I'm diving into that one for now and just singing a few opera songs here and there just to not forget. <laughs> so you mentioned Phantom, I'm sorry my dog is farting, <laughs> but um, what are some of the other musical theater ro uh, roles you might like to play? Well I'd love to play Tony in West Side Story although I'm Brazilian so don't know if that will happen, but <laughs> vocally, I'd love to play Tony. I think it's an incredible singing. It's so beautiful. And I'd love to one day be Phantom. 
Phantom of the Opera one day. I've auditioned for Pianji in the past, the operatic tenor in Phantom. And I got the role, but because of visas, I, I, I couldn't, they couldn't offer me the, the role because of visas. But I'd love to be Phantom one day and I'd love to play Le Mis. I'd love to play Javert. Mm. I'd love to play the villain. Sometimes you tenors, we get tired of being the, the good guys. <laughs> So you want to do a bit of that, that bad guy role. That's, that's very, yeah, that would be Absolutely. great to see you doing. Um, do you have like a favorite old composer like Rodgers and Hammerstein or Jerome Kern or somebody from? Um, I think my favorite has to be Bernstein. I think Leonard Bernstein is incredible. I think the way he managed to, to, to really put some intricate rhythms together with some beautiful melodies and it's just incredible. And his connection, you know, with Sondheim for West Side Story, with the lyrics. And I think Bernstein is one of my favorite, let's say, musical theater composers in the class, in the, like old musical theater, classical musical theater, Bernstein. Rogers and Hamstein, you can't go wrong with them. <laughs> oh, absolutely. How about on the classical side? So of the roles you've done, um, do you have a favorite so far? Uh, my favorite role that I've done, I think it was The Elixir of Love by Donizetti, and it was the role of Nemorino. And it's such like a, a funny character, and he's so loving and so immature at the same time, jovial. It's a beautiful role to play, very beautiful. And you get to sing some really beautiful melodies. But I think my favorite composer or my favorite style of classical music is the more romantic style like Puccini and, and Verdi. I, I think we always like the, the things that we can't sing. So I, you know, my voice <laughs> is not really, or it's not really built. Although I can sing the arias and I can sing the songs, but I'll, I, right now I wouldn't perform the whole opera, you know, because you need to be, you need to have a more developed voice. Your voice needs to be bigger. I have a, a lyrical voice. I don't really have a dramatic tenor voice, but I love Puccini. I love Puccini. Just love it so much. I think it, it really touches the heart. That's a great thing about classical music too, though, is that uh, we tend to develop a little bit later. Um, in pop, you can have you know people being sensations quite early, but classical music, it really takes the time for the voice to develop. And so what are some roles you'd like to play in the future once you're ready for them? Uh, I'd love to play, I've played Rodolfo from La Boheme before, but I'd love to do it again once I'm, I'm more developed and a bit older. I'd love to do that again. I'd love to do Turandot one day when to get to sing Nesson Dorma on the big stage. That would be incredible. And let's see which other. I'd love to play Rigoletto as well from Verdi. Some some really good songs in Rigoletto, like La Donne Mobile. But I've been singing those songs as a solo and in concerts for <laughs> my whole life. That's what people want to hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about is there a particular opera house that you have a dream or, or conductor that you have a dream of working with? Uh, I, think, I think the Royal Opera House here in London, it's, it's incredible. It's, times to watch operas and to have coachings and just to be in that atmosphere where you're in the cafe and all of a sudden a massive opera star is just passing by and and saying hi and you, you just feel like a little kid um i think the other opera house is probably my favorite house together with the metropolitan but it's just because the other opera house i have been very close by here and it's kind of always been close to me. So I think that's probably my favorite opera house and that hopefully one day it can be there.
Um, can you see yourself being part of another group in the future, like a crossover collaboration? Yeah, I was part of a group before, and although the, the group doesn't exist anymore, it was really fun, to be honest. And I think it has really rewarding things and really challenging things when you are in a group, because I think it firstly comes from choosing the rep, you know, like, no. And you have to know yourself very well. You have to be able to have a, a very straightforward relationship to the person or to the people that you are in the group because without honesty and without, and you know, and we are artists. Some, some people have really big egos and, or egos and sometimes it's hard. So I think I would, I totally would be in a group again. And I think it's super fun. I'd, I'd love to, to be in a group like Il Divo or Il Volo. I mm. think the music they create is incredible. I love Il Divo and Il Volo. Even Il Volo, the, the song, that famous song that called Grande Amore, is just beautiful, beautiful. Like what they've done, it's incredible. And they managed to have three tenors, three operatic tenors, like Il Divo, Re really reaching for for the masses and, and touching people's hearts with with that song. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I agree. I, I sing with my sister too, and we've known each other forever. <laughs> and there's definitely benefits, and there's you know there's times when you want to kill each other. But um, what are some <laughs> things you'd like to do in the future? Like yeah, you know, maybe an album, or once this is all calmed down. Uh, well, I really would love to, I'm kind of thinking already, I have the idea in my head, but I'd love to release either an EP or a small album with some classical musical theater, you know, featuring some tenors and some Barry tenor songs and in, in the old, going from the olden days until, until like the big songs you have today in Phantom or in Lean La Miss and going back as well in like in singing a bit of Oklahoma and I sing a little bit of South Pacific nice. just mixing a bit of musical theater I'd love to to do a, a musical theater album one day well, that would be absolutely brilliant I loved the last one you did so it would be great to hear oh, you do all these old songs <laughs> so thank you so much for talking with us today Lupancy Thank you so much. Absolutely. I hope you're well. I hope everyone is keeping themselves safe and fingers crossed theaters will be back soon. Yes, absolutely. And then we can all go and see you. So um, until then, we'll see, look for the video coming on your uh, Instagram and Facebook page. Is that right? Lovely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lou Percy. Have a good rest of your day. You too, Natasha. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>